who will purify the church? God or Satan? Many Adventists believe that the separation of the wicked from the righteous will happen through persecution, that the wicked will leave from among our ranks, in the church, and will eventually be destroyed by the seven plagues. Yet, a deeper look at the scriptures and the spirit of prophecy, will give clarity on the subject. Let's review Satan's attack on the church. We start this study with Revelation chapter 12 verses 6 and 14. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time, and times, and half a time, from the face of the serpent. The early Christian church, the woman, faced persecution and was driven from the promised land, Jerusalem, by Titus in 70 AD, into the land of the Gentiles, represented by the wilderness. The church would be nourished away from her home, Jerusalem, for a period of 1,260 years. This period is also known as the Dark Ages. The 1,260-year period ended in 1798, and 46 years later in 1844. The judgment was set in Daniel 7, meaning the judgment of the dead started. But what else happened in 1844? The Adventist Church came on the scene, preaching the judgment of the dead. This was the only church to appear at the end of this time period, so she rightly claims the identity of the woman, God's church, in verse 15. Let us continue reading. Verse 15, And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. This verse tells of Satan's strategic attack against the church, to flood it with unconverted souls, or persons. Yet there is a help from God described in the next verse. Verse 16, And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth, and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. To understand this allegory, let us review this truth in The Parable of the Wheat and Tares Matthew 13 verse 24 Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. Verse 25 But while men slept, his enemy, Satan, came and sowed tares among the wheat, and went his way. Let's dissect these verses. The field must be the church of God in the world. The founders of this church started out well, they were rooted in present truth. God was with them and they were zealous for His honor. As soon as the urgency of Jesus' soon coming waned, the church's principles and standards became more and more lax in practice. It was then that men slept, and the enemy, Satan, began his work to bring in the unconsecrated and unconverted. Their influence, he hoped, would cause the truth to be of no effect. Certainly no one would say that everyone in the church is a true-hearted saint. Verse 26, But when the blade was sprung up, and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. Let's read from Christ Object Lessons page 70, paragraph 3. Here is the quote. He that sowed the good seed, is the son of man. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The good seed represents those who are born of the word of God, the truth. The tares represent a class who are the fruit or embodiment of error, of false principles. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. Neither God nor his angels ever sowed a seed that would produce a tare. The tares are always sown by Satan, the enemy of God and man. So, the act of flooding the church with unconverted members was Satan's plan to destroy the very last message that is to go through all the earth, the message of the kingdom also known as the message of the judgment of the living. This fact is also confirmed by the symbolism of the flood coming out the dragon's mouth in Revelation 12. Let's go back to Matthew 13, verses 27 and 28. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, 
didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? Verse 29, 30 But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now let's read from Testimonies to Ministers page 46 to hear Ellen White's commentary. Tares will appear among the wheat. But it would do more harm to weed out the tares, unless in God's appointed way, than to leave them alone. While the Lord brings into the church those who are truly converted, Satan at the same time brings into the church persons who are not converted into its fellowship. While Christ is sowing the good seed, Satan is sowing the tares. There are two opposing influences continually exerted on the members of the church. One influence is working for the purification of the church, and the other for the corrupting of the people of God. Since the tares are not uprooted until the time of the harvest, we need to understand the significance of this. What happens at the time of the harvest and the wheat and tares are finally separated? First, we will deal with the tares. The scripture says that the tares are taken first and bound in bundles to be destroyed. Let's read what Ellen G. White writes about this judgment, which happens exclusively in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, also known as the Judgment of Ezekiel 9. This is found in the Review and Herald, September 23, 1873. Quote, Who are standing in the council of God at this time? Is it those who virtually excuse wrongs among the professed people of God, and murmur in their hearts, if not openly, against those who would reprove sin? Is it those who take their stand against them, and sympathize with those who commit wrong? No, indeed. These, unless they repent, and leave the work of Satan in oppressing those who have the burden of the work, and holding up the hands of sinners in Zion, will never receive the mark of God's sealing approval. They will fall in the general destruction of all the wicked, represented by the five men bearing slaughter weapons. Mark this point with care. Those who receive the pure mark of truth, wrought in them by the power of the Holy Ghost, represented by a mark, by the man in linen, are those that sigh and cry for all the abominations that are done in the church. Their love for purity and the honor and glory of God is such, and they have so clear a view of the exceeding sinfulness of sin, that they are represented as being in an agony, even sighing and crying. Read Ezekiel, chapter 9. Especially in the closing work for the church, in the sealing time of the 144,000, who are to stand without fault before the throne of God, will they feel most deeply the wrongs of God's professed people. This is forcibly set forth by the prophet's illustration of the last work under the figure of the men, each having a slaughter weapon in his hand. One man among them was clothed with linen, with a writer's ink horn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Here's another quote from Bible Commentary Volume 4, page 1161, paragraph 5 and letter number 106 written in September 26, 1909. The angel with the writer's ink horn is to place a mark upon the foreheads of all who are separated from sin and sinners. And the destroying angel follows this angel. Study the ninth chapter of Ezekiel. These words will be literally fulfilled. Yet the time is passing, and the people are asleep. They refuse to humble their souls and to be converted. Not a great while longer will the Lord bear with the people who have such great and important truths revealed to them, but who refuse to bring these truths into their individual experience. The time is short, God is calling. Will you hear? Will you receive his message? Will you be converted before it is too late? Soon, very soon, Every case will be decided for eternity. And again, in Letters and Manuscripts, Volume 1, 
Letter 8, Ellen White even writes to her own children about the slaughter of Ezekiel 9. Dear children, do not rest a moment if you do not. God loves to hear the prayers of the young. Call upon him and make your peace with him that you may stand in the day of slaughter. I do love you, children, and I want you to be saved in the kingdom and enjoy the beauty of the earth made new. Get ready, get ready, love not this world, love not the wicked, but God and those who have his image. As you can see, there are repeated references to the sealing and the slaughter of Ezekiel 9 by the prophet of the Lord. Now to deal with the symbolism of wheat. As discussed tares are gathered first, only then can the wheat be taken to the barn. The wheat can be none other than the righteous, those who are sealed in the church and found worthy to stand in the judgment of Ezekiel 9. They are the only ones that can usher the other children God has, from all the churches, into God's kingdom. Now let us go back to Revelation 12 verse 16. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth, and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. There is only one place where the earth opened up that is recorded in the Bible, and it is found in Numbers 26 verse 10. Let's read it. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up together with Korah when that company died, the time the fire devoured 250 men, and they became a sign. If they became a sign to us then we must examine why were they destroyed. Let us read verse 9 of the same chapter. These are the Dathan and Abram who were famous in the congregation, who strove against Moses and against Aaron in the company of Korah when they strove against the Lord. These men were the tares of their generation, fighting against the inspired prophets of God, those whom God had ordained, yet they were self-appointed leaders. They had a following and respect among the people, but they didn't understand to fight against the Lord's messengers, is to fight against God Himself. But why must the wicked be taken out from among the righteous? According to Testimonies, Volume 3, page 266, if the presence of one Achan was sufficient to weaken the whole camp of Israel, can we be surprised at the little success which attends our efforts when every church and almost every family has its Achan? If the presence of one Achan was sufficient to weaken the whole camp of Israel, can we be surprised at the little success which attends our efforts when every church and almost every family has its Achan? Page 265 says that One sinner may diffuse darkness that will exclude the light of God from the entire congregation. The reality is, that the church, being overrun with sinners, must be cleansed, in order to stand with God's supreme protection during the time of trouble. Let's read Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 80 for greater clarity. Quote, we have been inclined to think that where there are no faithful ministers there can be no true Christians, but this is not the case. God has promised that where the shepherds are not true He will take charge of the flock Himself. God has never made the flock wholly dependent upon human instrumentalities. But the days of purification of the church are hastening on apace. God will have a people pure and true. In the mighty sifting soon to take place we shall be better able to measure the strength of Israel. The signs reveal that the time is near when the Lord will manifest that His fan is in His hand, and He will thoroughly purge His floor. End of quote. Contrary to popular belief, it is not persecution that is responsible for the cleansing of the church. From the parables and types in the scriptures and the spirit of prophecy it is clearly seen, that this is a work that God Himself will accomplish. It is not the devil's work to help the church rid itself of members that he brought in in the first place. Simply put, persecution would drive the hypocrites out. After God does this strange work of destroying the wicked in the church, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit will come upon those who have accepted the present truth, overcome temptation, and have grown up into Christian maturity to reflect the very image of Christ. Thus, the church is enabled to take her stand in truth and righteousness. Isaiah 62 verse 1 and 2 says, For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness, and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. 
And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all kings thy glory, and thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. It is then that the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Satan, the dragon, will be so enraged that he cannot destroy the church and harm the sealed saints, that he will go off to war against those who are coming out of Babylon, the fallen churches, as they are heeding the warning, do not worship the beast or his image. While they are yet coming out, they too will go through a great tribulation. Those in the church who have been sealed will have already gone through Jacob's time of trouble, and are pictured as standing on Mount Zion in Revelation 7. Also pictured is the great multitude, who will join them and receive the commandments of God with gladness. Again, the first fruits will be instrumental in gathering the second fruits as they conduct the loud cry once the church is purified. God saving His church by separating the wheat from the tares is also depicted in Hosea 2 verses 14-15, the Scripture say. Therefore, behold, I will allure her, and bring her into the wilderness, and speak comfortably unto her. And I will give her her vineyards from thence, and the valley of Acre for a door of hope, and she shall sing there, as in the days of her youth, and as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. Let's pause here. The Lord says He will talk comfortably to His church using the pronoun she, and, her, and places her in the wilderness. God once again depicts His church as a woman, consistent with the symbolism in Revelation 12. Note that in Revelation 12, the woman, the church, is also in the wilderness. Most importantly in this scripture, God says He will give to her, the woman, which we know is the church, the valley of Acre, for a door of hope. The question is, what and where is the valley of Acre? Let's read Joshua 7 verses 24 to 26 to find out. And Joshua, and all Israel with him, took Achan the son of Zerah, and the silver, and the garment, and the wedge of gold, and his sons, and his daughters, and his oxen, and his asses, and his sheep, and his tent, and all that he had, and they brought them unto the valley of Acre. Then Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones, and burned them with fire, after they had stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Wherefore the name of that place was called, The Valley of Acre, unto this day. Let's go back to our text in Hosea 2, starting with verse 16 to 20. And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi, and shalt call me no more Bali. For I will take away the names of Baalim out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. And in that day will I make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, and with the fowls of heaven, and with the creeping things of the ground, and I will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth, and will make them to lie down safely. And I will betroth thee unto me for ever, yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness, and in judgment, and in loving kindness and in mercies. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. In summary, God is repeating one truth in four different ways, from four different viewpoints in scriptures. In parabolic form, in Matthew 13, Jesus says the tares will grow until the time of the harvest, that is, once the harvest commences, they will be gathered to be burned. In Revelation 12, the woman, the church, is saved from the tares, who are depicted as a flood, by the earth, which opens up its mouth to swallow the flood. In Hosea 2, God says directly that He is giving the woman, the church, the valley of Acre, as a door of hope, this being the very place where Achan was separated from Israel and destroyed. Then is described a church who has no barriers to any blessings from God, and who finally experiences oneness with God, and peace. 
This has never happened before in the earth's history. In Ezekiel 9, God gets into detail about how this judgment is executed. May God help us to come nigh to Him while there is yet time. We will end this study with a scripture reading in Romans 9 verses 22-28. What if God, wanting to show His wrath and to make His power known, endured with much long-suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and that He might make known the riches of His glory on the vessels of mercy, which He had prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom He called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. As He says also in Hosea, I will call them My people, who were not my people. And her beloved, who was not beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people. There they shall be called sons of the living God. Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. Suggested reading for further study. Revelation chapter 7 and chapter 12. Hosea chapter 2. And Ezekiel chapter 9.